this school. Are you guys going to stay in today? Or? I mean, I don't think Sister Kia is here yet, but whatever you guys want to do is fine. There's some notes on the back table regardless. But we'll go ahead and get started, and let's just open up the word of prayer before we do anything else. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we give you uh, all praise and glory because you alone are holy and worthy, Lord. Even right now, Lord, we rebuke any attack at the enemy that should come our way, Lord. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. We bind any working that the devil might try to have in our services today, Lord. Even whether it's the Sunday school or the uh, preaching or anything at all, Lord, in any way, we bind it in the name of Jesus, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would just have your way like never before, that the Holy Ghost can move freely, that we would not hinder him as well within our own hearts and within our own spheres, that our hearts and our minds would be good soil for the word to follow, and that we may remember it throughout the week. But even about, even about more than that, Lord, of Christ, otherwise that we may be transformed in the image of Jesus Christ, Lord. Yes, all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Like I said, there's notes on the back table if you guys want them. Um, now we're going to go ahead and start with Sunday School. We've been talking about the book of Psalms. We've been doing a study on the book of Psalms. And when we look at the book of Psalms, how many people wrote the book of Psalms? Well, let me rephrase that. You're right, Carl. You got the right answer. But the book of Psalms was edited. I should put that better, phrase that better. It was edited or compiled by three different people. We know multiple people wrote the book of Psalms. It was not just David, like some people suppose, uh, or claim, or anything like that. But when we talk about the book of Psalms, we have to remember that it is a psalm book. It is a Jewish psalm book. And how many divisions are within the book of Psalms itself? It is five, because, and what do those five books correspond with? The Pentateuch. The five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Last week we talked about different styles of the Hebrew poetry. And when we, we brought out some things that probably weren't aware of before, like one third of the, or roughly, uh, let me go back. Yeah, roughly one third of the entire Old Testament contains poetry. When we look at the Old Testament, every book of the Old Testament contains poetry, except for Leviticus, Ruth, 2 Kings, Nehemiah, Esther, and Haggai. Now, we did go into detail and we talked about different styles of Hebrew poetry last week. And the whole purpose for that is to give us an idea on the different styles that they had to kind of follow suit because when we look at the book of Psalms, it is exactly a song. If we get up here and we start singing a song any which way, well, it starts throwing people off. And it's not always just a song, but it's the beat as well. I remember years ago, Sister Sandy playing the piano and then after service going to Brother Dennis, somebody was clapping and throwing me off. That was the night I tried to start clapping and and, well, I wasn't on beat with it. So when we look at Jewish poetry, there was a style to it. There was a rhythm. And there was a structure to it. Now today we're going to start looking at words throughout the book of Psalms that might distinguish the book or make it familiar or might appear over and over and over more in this book than it does anywhere in the Bible. And we're also going to be looking at some obscure words that maybe we don't know the meanings to. And the reason for that is being is language is extremely important. If you're talking to somebody and you're using words that they don't know, you're going to get it here in the headlight book. If somebody from England comes over and tells my dad that they have a V under their bonnet, well, he might look at them a little funny and they're referring to the hood of their car where over there they call it the bonnet and we call it a hood. Differences in words makes, uh, is an important distinction in understanding what one is talking about. If I went, uh, somebody from England came over today and 
was talking to somebody in here and said, Brother Eli put a whole bag, large bag of cans in my boot. Well, you might give him you know, a look at what is he talking about? You can't put a bag of cans in a boot, but rather to them, a boot would be the trunk of the car. So words are extremely important. When we, Frank C. Alexander in an article, Compre uh, Understanding Vocabulary, stated this, words are the currency of communication. They also said this, comprehension improves what you know uh, when you know what the words mean. It's important to know what we're looking at. If we all were taking a trip over to France and took maybe somebody from the backwoods of Kentucky or something like that, or somebody who's hit under a rock their entire life, and took them over to France with us, showed them the Eiffel Tower, and they go, well, that's a pretty neat tower. We might very much go, that's the Eiffel Tower. You don't know what you're looking at. Or we could take them up to um, the 9-11 Memorial and take them to the site there where they built the new tower. And they'll look at it and go, oh yeah, what's so special about this? Well, this is where 9-11 happened. Well, what's that? And you look at it like, where have you been your entire life? Understanding words and their meanings are extremely important. And the Bible is no different. If we're truly going to understand it, if we're truly going to become masters of God's word, we need to at least make an attempt to understand these words. Know what they mean. How are they implied? What was the writer trying to relate to us? Understanding language is extremely imperative if we're going to know what God is trying to relate to us. So when we look at scripture, the truth of the matter is, there are no unimportant words in Scripture. Everyone was written down with a specific meaning and a specific purpose because the Holy Ghost was trying to relay something to us. And even in those genealogies, or even as we'll be looking at the titles in the book of Psalms, we can glean so much from those words that we do not know, from those things that we just glance over. The first, and before we get started, would someone please read Proverbs 25 and verse 2. 25 and verse 2 of Proverbs. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. That is our task. If we are going to truly understand God's word, if we're going to find the nuggets, if we're going to really dig deep, well, if we're really going to understand it, it's only going to come when we are willing to dig deep, to search it out. And truth be told, we can do more uh, in-depth study of the Bible in five minutes than it might have taken somebody years ago an hour to maybe dig because we have those kind of resources. So for us to not to try to go deeper, we have the resources. We can do it. And that is why we're going to be really looking at some of these words. If we would turn to Psalm 22 and verse 1, Psalm 22, 1, you might as well just keep your hand in the book of Psalms, because of course that's where we're going to be studying at. But Psalm 22 and verse 1, I'm not going to make anyone read it. Now, as a side note, this is an extremely important psalm to begin with because this psalm was written 500 years before crucifixion was invented, and if you read it out in detail, read through the entire psalm, it actually goes into detail the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But we're not even going to focus on verse 1, but we're going to back up to the title where it reads the fifth messianic psalm to the chief musician upon Ageleth, Shahar, Hind of the Morning, a psalm of David. If we're going to be focusing on that phrase, Ageleth, Shahar. This is the opening title to Psalm 22. 
And as um, I read here, you might not have that in your Bible, but it translates to hind of the morning. Now, you're going to find there's going to be a lot of conjecture or speculation or going back and forth on these different titles, but <coughs> it's important for us to know nonetheless. Some people argue that this phrase is the name of the... Uh, let me back up so I know what I... This is a reference to a musical instrument, even though most people disagree with that. And you're going to find that's true with a lot of these obscure uh, words that we're looking at, or probably at least half of them, that there's going to be debate that it's an musical instrument, that it's the title of the poem, or song itself, that it's one or the other, that it's both. But they debate, like I said, that it was a musical instrument, and keep in mind, if, it's a, if it is a musical instrument, it's been lost to us. We do not know what it was, what kind it was. But if we would take a trip over to the Asiatic people during this time, they often titled their poems with names that had nothing to do with the poem itself. So, and I don't disagree that this title here, Nijal Shahar, is the title of the poem itself, which means hind of the morning. But when we read the passage, it has nothing to do with the deer. It has nothing to do with the morning. But rather, it talks about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It refers to one who is in agony and sorrow, that uh, they've been betrayed, they've been thrown to the wolves. Wolves for uh, lack of a better explanation, uh, wording. And when we go back to this time frame, it, these people, when they titled the poems, they didn't necessarily have to do with anything in the poem itself. If we come to the Western culture and we titled a poem, and um, I talked about my feelings of being betrayed, and I called it uh, Rose of Sunset or the Sunset Rose. That has nothing to do with it. But that's kind of how they did it in their culture. They would often title poems with titles that have nothing to do with the content of the poem itself. Schofield argued that this uh, is Angela Shahar is actually the poem, to the, the title to the poem. According to Adam Clark's commentary, um, this person, Calumet, argues for the last translation and translates this to a psalm of David addressed to the music master who presides over the band called the morning high. So he argues that it is a reference to the band itself, to the people playing, to the musicians. And then you'll have the other group that argues that this phrase is actually referring to the melody or the chant that the poem is set to which would not be completely absurd to think of because when we learn about the Book of Psalms, there are key words throughout different portions of it that actually give us indication that there should be a pause here, there should be a break here, and so forth and so forth. So it, this phrase is either a reference to the name of the band, the musicians playing it, the title of the song itself, uh, or the melody or chant, or the musical instrument to be played, or multiple of these at the same time. Now the next word we're going to look at is a little bit more common to us. We find it in Psalms chapter 43 and verse 13. For, I'm sorry, 41 and verse 13. And Psalm 41 and verse 13. Just back up and find a second. If someone would go ahead and please read Psalm 41 and verse 13. So what were the last two words of this verse? Amen, amen. So we'll be looking at the word amen. It comes, it occurs four times in the book of Psalms. 
I did not look at different times that it was used in the entire Bible itself, but within the book of Psalms, since that's our primary study, it occurs in four different verses. 41.13, 72.19, 89.52, and 106. 48. It comes from the Hebrew word Amen. And according to Strong's Hebrew dictionary, it means short, abstract, faithfulness, truly. Or the more common phrase that we've heard as it's been preached. So be it and true. So be it is the one we hear time and time again. This word amen in the book of Psalms is interesting because if we would go back and study the book of Psalms and look at the divisions, what comes after, comes between uh, Psalm 41 and verse 13 and Psalm 42, 1, so what comes between 72, 19 and 73, 1, 89, 52 and chapter 91 and verse 1, and so forth. Well, those three for sure. And 106, 48, and 107 in verse 1. There's something interesting in those breaks. And if we would go back, we have already discussed it this morning in reference and in review. There are five things happening throughout the book of Psalms. Those are the five divisions. Division. The five divisions. Book one, a reference to Genesis. Book two, reference to uh, Exodus. And three, four, and five. These divisions, book one, uh, let me back up. Book two falls between 41 13 and 42, 1. Book 3 falls between 72, 19 and 73, 1. And so forth. So when we look at this word, amen, it's breaking up the divisions within the book of Psalms itself. In fact, the word amen closes the end of every book in the book of Psalms except for book five. Now I want to play another preacher's take on the word Amen. This is S.M. Lockridge preaching his famous sermon, Amen. We would not know it probably by that title, but rather we would know it by the um, clip we've heard time and time again, um, That's My King. Amen simply means that which is certain, that which is credible, that which is true. Amen simply means so be it. And it is in thy purpose, as it is in thy promises, so be it in our praise. So be it in our world. In the Old Testament, there are at least 30 references to Amen. And in the New Testament, there are at least 50 references to Amen. And in every one of these references, you will find that Amen is a word of affirmation. It has a force of a severity. And it has a note of finality. When you say it, you have said it, and there's just nothing to talk. The best you can do is repeat. And don't knock repetition. You know, every once in a while, maybe once or twice a year, I'll preach a sermon they had Calvary that I preached before. And invariably, somebody comes charging up to me, Pastor, I've I heard that one before. And I said, yes, and if it didn't bear repeating, I shouldn't have preached it in the first place. Don't have 
repetition. You see, there are no degrees of holiness. You know, God is just holy. He's not less holy one day and more holy another day. He's just holy. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above him stood the servant, and each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, said, Holy. And I get the idea that the one in the north cried, Holy. And the one in the south tried to find something to talk, and he couldn't come up with it, and he cried, Holy. And the one in the east tried to find something better to say, and he couldn't find it, and he cried, Holy! And the one in the west tried to find something to talk, and he couldn't come up with it, and he cried, Holy! Holy is the Lord of hosts! I'm trying to tell you, don't my repetition. We have no spiritual that just says, Amen. Amen. And that's all. Just this. By the third time around, things start happening. <laughs> don't, knock, don't knock repetition. That reason we have a two-fold way of man, and a four-fold, and a three-fold, and Satan has a seven-fold way of man. And that doesn't mean five, six, seven, but it means without number, without eight. Amen it simply means yes, Lord. And everybody here ought to say yes to the Lord. That means let the Lord have his way in your life. Just think what would happen here tonight. If every one of us just let the Lord have his way. So that was S.M. Lockridge's uh, take on Amen in its definition. But you'll find the word Amen at the end of every single book except for book 5 and the book of Hebrews. Now we turn to Psalm chapter 46 and verse 1. And I'll read that. We're going to be looking more so at the titles than anything because that's where these words appear. We talk about these titles being added at a later uh, by the compiler of this portion of the book of Psalms to give us an idea of who wrote the book of Psalms and to whom it was written for. And in 46 and verse 1, or even in the title there, it's referred to it in my Bible as the 10th Messianic Psalm, which they kept track of those. It says, To the chief musician for the sons of Korah, a song upon Alamoth, maidens or virgins. So, a song upon Alamoth. What is Alamoth? Alamoth is also mentioned in 1 Chronicles 15 and verse 20. First Chronicles 15 and 20, and I'll go ahead and read that because oh, I realize these are going to be larger words. And I'll take the fall for mispronouncing. 15 and verse 20. And Zechariah and Aziel and Sh uh, Shemeramoth and Jehelai and Unai and Eli and Maasai and Benali upon salt trees with salt trees on Alamoth. So Alamoth was mentioned in the Chronicles when he was listening to singers and so forth. It comes from the Hebrew word Alamoth. And according to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it means properly girls, the soprano or female voices, even perhaps falsetto. So some argue that the word Alamoth actually refers to 
um, secret or hidden things. If we go to Adam Clark's commentary, he reads that the Vol um, Latin Vulgate translates this as Arcano Catabalt. They sang secret things or mysteries, probably prophetic hymns. Adam Clark commentary states, he also states that this could mean concerning youth, infancy of the son, or it could be virgin, referring to the group of singers or the girls. So it could, when we're looking at that word Alamoth, a song upon Alamoth, it could actually mean secret or hidden things, or it could be referring to the fact that perhaps this psalm itself was sung by a group of young girls, young virgin girls, and that this psalm itself <coughs> was prophetic, speaking of hidden or secret things. So it, it could be referring to several things. It could be a title. It could be the group that sang it. Or it could be referring to a group of young girls who sing concerning secret or hidden things. Now we come back to a word that we are common, that is common to us and familiar once again. And that is the word blessed. Why do we say blessed in the Beatitudes is beyond me because we all know the correct pronunciation is blessed. But nonetheless, that word blessed occurs in 47 verses in the book of Psalms. In 25 verses of the book of Psalms, the Hebrew word Esher was translated blessed. We find that in Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So the blessed there is the word, Hebrew word, was translated from the Hebrew word, Esher, and according to Strong's Hebrew dictionary, it means happiness, construction as interjection, blessed, happy. So when we look at this word in Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1, it means happy. We also find another use, um, another translation for the word blessed found in Psalm 18 and 46. Psalm 18 and verse 46, where it said, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be, the, um, be exalted. Here, it is from the Hebrew word barak, and according to Strong's dictionary, it means to kneel. By, by implication to bless God. So we're looking at this, it means to give thanks, to bless God in a kneeling possession. So we're also recognizing our reverence for him. It occurs in 68 verses in the book of Psalms, and has been translated blessed, 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 shall bless, praised, let us kneel, he will bless, and blessed, uh, blessed. Then we have another word for the word blessed that was translated for the word blessed in the book of Psalms, and that seems to be Baraka. We find that in Psalms 21 and verse 6. Psalm 21, 6. Where the Bible says, For thou hast made him most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceedingly glad with thy countenance. For thou hast made him most blessed forever. When we look at this word, it has been translated blessing, blessed, blessing. And one time it was even translated pools. According to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it means benediction, prosperity. Blessing, liberal, pool, pleasant. Then we have one more translation for the word blessed in the book of Psalms. And that is taken from the Hebrew word asher, or alsher. We find that in Psalms 41 and verse 2. Psalms 41, 2. Where the Bible says, The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive 
and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of the enemies. And according to Strong's, this means to be straight, to be level, right, happy, to go forward, to be honest or proper. So when we look at that word blessed in the book of Psalms, it does not always mean happiness, but rather it can have several different meanings. And all that is right there in your notes. Now we're going to get to the probably the last word of the day. And this one is brought to you by the letter G. And that is Gittin. It appears on Psalms chapter 8 and verse 1, Psalm 81 and 1, and Psalm 84 and 1. I'm going to go to Psalm chapter 8 and verse 1, since it's closer in my Bible at this point in time. It appears in only these three verses in the book of Psalms. Of course, it appears in the title. In Psalm chapter 8 and verse 1, we are looking at the titles in the book of Psalms to try to get a look at those words that maybe are that are unfamiliar to us or unfamiliar <coughs> to give us a better understanding of the psalm itself. And in the title of Psalm 8 and verse 1, to the chief musician upon Gittin, mine has in translation a Gittite heart, is what Big is promoting, a psalm of David. So what is a Gittin? Like we've already said, it appears three times in the book of Psalms. It comes from the Hebrew word that sounds, from the spelling, to me it looks pretty much like Gitia, or close to that. And if we would go to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it refers to, it means a Gittite heart. Now like everything else in the Bible that is uncommon, we've already said this morning that a lot of these words their trans, true translation have been lost to the common era. And I am not using that in the sense of the world, but word where they're trying to replace uh, B.C. and A.D., but rather our era right now, the present era, where we're living in. We do not know the exact definition of this word. And what happens when things people are unsure of things in the Bible? If you look at one commentary, you will say one thing. You look at another commentary, you will say another. But Strong's is pretty clear that it is a Gittite heart. Now people will argue over this instrument to begin with, and not all are certain that it was a heart to begin with. You have those in the other camp that claim that it was possibly a wind instrument, or some other string instrument. Some say that this would have been an instrument that a farmer would have played while sitting at the wine press while it's being treaded down, being prepared. But one thing is sure. The it appears that it is an instrument, and the fact that it has almost the word Gittite in it to begin with, it comes from the Gittite people. And who were the Gittite people? They were people from Gath. Gath, that word should strike a bell with us. And it should strike some form of familiarity because we've heard that in reference to somebody who's famous in the Word of God and his name to begin with. Does anybody want to take a guess at who it is? Somebody from Gath. Give me a hint. He was pretty tall. Goliath. Goliath. It was Goliath. When we look at Gath, Gath was one of five main Philistine city or city states, whatever you want to refer to him as. Goliath was from Gath. And because Goliath was from Gath, we know from preaching and studying out the Word of God that there were four other people that were from Gath as well. Yep, go ahead. Goliath had four brothers. Is that why David really took five stones? I don't know, but it sure makes it a good preaching subject. 
David took five stones because he was going to go and kill the rest of the brothers when he did his doing it. I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, maybe it was. We don't have confirmation in the Word of God, but we do know that he took five stones. Goliath was in death, and he had four brothers. And there actually came one point in time where David was in Gap for some time. How long it was, how short it was is unknown. I don't think it was a very long time. I could not find a time frame. But in 1 Samuel chapter 5, uh, 21 and verse 10, 1 Samuel 21, 10, it's like, Yeah, yeah. But what does 1 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 10 state? David arose and said that day to the bear saw and to the king of Gath. And to the king of Gath. If we would look at this passage and read the surrounding verses of Psalm, uh, not Psalm, 1 Samuel, Samuel 21 10, we would find that. Saul is finally taking vengeance on David. He is now mad at David, and David is on the run. So he's on the run from Saul. And one of the first places he goes is to Gath to seek refuge. And we find that the king takes him in and accepts him. How long he is there is unknown, but he will start talking in the king's ear. You know who this is? This is the one who they say that Saul killed his thousands, but David is ten thousand. This is our enemy. How many times has he come against us and defeated us? And because of that, for fear for his life, David starts acting like a madman. He starts running up against the wall, basically scratching at him, I believe. He puts on the act of a madman so that because he's fearful for his life, that the king's going, the king of Gath is going to want him dead now, too. So what they do is they force him out of the city, and he flees to Adala. We know he resides in the cave of Adala from there. But if there's one thing we know about David is he was passionate about something. And what was that something he was passionate about? Well, besides his God, brothers, there's one thing that I would say he'd like to do on this earth. Especially as a pastime or a hobby. He loved musical instruments. He loved instruments. He wrote songs. We know that because I think 72 songs in the book of Psalms are written by David, are attributed to him. And what happens to a, a, music, a musician? They're obsessed with music. And if David was talented, they say people that have musical brains, it's easier for them to pick up different things. I do not have that talent in any way. But you get Sister Beth, she can play the piano, the mandolin, the violin. She probably could pick up a guitar to some degree because she loves music. You come over to our house or go by at night, you're probably going to hear her strumming on the piano. Not because she has to, but it's something that she's enjoys. It's a passion of hers, and she's passionate with, about music, so she likes instruments. If David was passionate about music, like we all know he was, it would not have been uncommon for him to look at different instruments and gather and inquire about them, and how is this played, or maybe pick one up and start strumming on it, um, if it was a harp or if it was a uh, wind instrument. And to be honest, if David was the one that brought the get, get it to the Hebrews as an instrument, because at some point, if it was a musical instrument from Gath, there would have been, had to have been some time where it was introduced into the Hebrew culture, and at a point where they accepted it, and then a point where they learned how to play to begin with, and they did not have somebody who dwelt in Gath for some time that had an instructor that said, this is how you play it. Also, instruments that are similar, and people that know how to play those instruments, and we all know that David played the harp, if it would have been a harpist instrument, it probably wouldn't have taken long for David to pick up on it and play it again. So perhaps when he was 
fleeing from Gath, he took it with him. Who knows? But one thing we do know is it was an instrument, more than likely. It was taken from Gath. And somehow it got introduced into the Hebrew culture. And it was something that they had what they they accepted into their culture because we find them playing songs to Jehovah upon these instruments. So when we look at the Gittite, it might have been the instrument of farmer, but we definitely know it was from Gath. People argue over whether it was a wind instrument or if it was a string instrument. But if we go back to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, he outright claimed, or they outright claimed that it was a harp from Gath. So when we look at this song, it was given instruction that this song, along with Psalm 81 and 84, were to be played upon this part from Gath. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, that anything they want to add? I know that we're going to lowest low, and it may not be the jump from the hilltop and shout material, but Words are important. And if we're going to study something, if we're going to really know what it means and what they're trying to relay, we need to take those words that we don't understand or maybe are afraid of and try to understand them because that all has meaning to what we're studying. At this point in time, let us bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for something. There are some that most of them sing a lot of songs. Yep, they sing a lot of songs. Yes, and they're from the book of Psalms. And we handed out that paper uh, when we first opened that. There are even songs from the book of Psalms. There are songs in the book of Psalms, whether it's several verses or the entire chapter, that we've sang already in this church. Yep, exactly. So let us bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us, Lord. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high and there's none like you, Lord. Lord, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be prepared to receive the work you have for us today. And may we be willing to change. May we be willing to remove anything in our lives that will keep us from you, Lord. May we have a greater desire to draw closer to you than ever before. Anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Give them the songs you have us to sing. Anoint the uh, preacher today, Lord, that your words would flow forth from his mind and his lips, Lord. And may, Lord, we just give him a special blessing as well. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, Lord, you want this type of thing?